Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am Scott Bernstein, your host, along with my co-host, partner in crime, Jimmy Bucciolato, the doctor. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. Call me Stai. <laughs> we got Ben behind the glass, and we have a very, very special guest, uh, one of the premier, preeminent mob busters in the United States, uh, dating back almost four decades out on the East Coast in New England, uh, Stephen O'Donnell. Retired a member of the Rhode Island State Police, uh, worked for the RI uh, SP for roughly 30 years, had another five years of of uh, other uh, various law enforcement capacities. But he made his name and his reputation as a a go getting mob buster for uh, for the United States government and the Rhode Island State Police going after the patriarch of crime family, uh, which. If you know uh, the you know the mob uh, geography, uh, the patriarchas uh, inhabit Providence, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, some parts of New Hampshire, some some parts of Maine uh, and Connecticut. And uh, Steve O'Donnell, thank you so much for joining us. No, you're welcome. Glad to help out. And uh, we're gonna just dive right into the deep end of the pool. Um, I wanted to bring uh, Steve on to talk about. Something that is pretty fresh in uh, the news headlines and then use that as kind of an entry point to go back and look at something that happened maybe 30 years ago, which could be coming maybe or maybe not could be uh, arising uh, as a future indictment, uh, a murder case that has, has been cold for the last 30 years and it has been getting hotter over the last couple of years, but we don't know for sure if there, if there is or if there won't be an indictment, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the amazing and talented Tim white, uh, who is one of the original gangsters podcast, uh, you know, one of our, our closest colleagues, someone that we, we have so much respect for who, uh, reports out of the Providence area. He had a big, big blockbuster story about, uh, the the chief the chief of staff for the Rhode Island um, Congress for the, for the for the House of Representatives uh, in, in Rhode Island the chief of staff uh, a guy by the name of John Conti who has since uh, stepped down from his post since Tim White had this uh, big report that came out on the television news WPRI a couple weeks ago uh, that John Conti who was this uh, political power broker was in bed with the Providence faction of the patriarchal crime family. Specifically, he was in a marijuana business with a associate uh, patriarchal family enforcer named Raymond Scarface Jenkins. Him and Jenkins, I guess, had, had, had been very close since childhood. But through this investigation, Rhode Island State Police, uh, in these court filings, uh, surveilled John Conti going to meetings with high-level members of the patriarchal crime family in Providence going to a Christmas party specifically in 2020 where he interacted with probably right now the two biggest shot callers in Providence, uh, Matthew Goodlooking, Matty Guglia, Manny Jr. and Edward Little Eddie Lado. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. In that report, both Tim White and the Rhode Island State Police have named Eddie Lado as the recently promoted underboss of the patriarchal crime family. So I want to talk about the promotion. And then I also want to talk about the fact that Eddie Lato has been out of prison now for about three or four years. And ever since he walked out of a, about an eight year bid for extortion, he's had a possible murder case hanging over his head dating back 30 years ago, uh, last month or uh, 30 years ago in September, the Kevin Hanrahan hit September 18th, 1982, uh, a, another, Providence mob enforcer that was gunned down. You've had some grand jury testimony that links Lato to that case, but there has not been an indictment. But I digress. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. O'Donnell to, you know, maybe give, just give us some of your thoughts and insights on the lay of the land with this new uh, new report of the promotion of Lato about what's going on, you know, in the, in the political realm there with John Conti. And then maybe we can get into uh, what was going on back in the 90s after we, we touch on this stuff. No, sure thing, Scott. Just uh, I want to just clarify the story with Tim. I collaborate with Tim. Um, I do. Um, I'm the law enforcement analyst for WPRI TV. So, 
Um, I think he probably just misspoke, not intentionally, because it gets confusing. It was the deputy chief of staff of the speaker of the Rhode Island House of Representatives. It was okay. not a congressional staffer that was involved. Yes, I apologize. Was, um, Thank you for correcting me. No, no problem. That's um, people get very sensitive about that stuff. So you're you're right. Um, it was a videotape of Raymond Jenkins. They call him Ray Scarface Jenkins. And he was meeting with the deputy chief of staff in the state house lot, which is restricted to you know, members of the House and Senate which, and employees there. So it, it kind of just showcased that what's really happened in the organized crime world, where in the last maybe 10 years at least, uh, because of, I wouldn't say the demise, but because it's been broken up to an extent that everybody, there's a lot of people that, you know, they, they I don't know, I, like they like associating with these people for whatever reason. Um, they haven't learned to step away from those people, understanding this is a blood oath, criminal organization, no two ways about it. That if you grew up with them, look, I grew up the street, right across the street from a made guy. I'm not his friend. I don't hang around with him. So I think that's the the political piece that anybody involved in or politics or legitimate business should not be around these people because they're it's a sworn criminal organization. That's all they do. So all day long they just figure out scams and this one happened to be about legal marijuana. And one of the things that I used to tell when I was the superintendent of the state police in Rhode Island, I'll still talk about it today, is the marijuana legalization. You know, if that is good for the medical piece of it, you know, so be it. But as for keeping the criminal element out, all it's doing is inviting the colonels in. I testified to it as the colonel. I've spoken to multiple governors about it, that, you know, you these the licenses in Rhode Island are $500,000 a year. So just that's money that you're printing. And the organized crime may not be the face of it, certainly because they have criminal records, but this case kind of showcased the behind the scenes work. What happens is the wise, wise, the guy, wise guys will get involved behind the scenes. And obviously this case proves it out that they're involved. Um, a mayor in Fall River got indicted and went to jail for shaking down marijuana business. So it's the new shakedown, the new, with that amount of money, you know, the wise guys, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out where they're going to go when it comes to making money. And if they can hide it behind, you know, a legal business, they're going to be right behind it, which they are. And I'm sure more cases will unfold as we, as we speak every day. As for Eddie Lato, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think you know this, so I'm probably talking to the choir with both of you, that historically, New England power base from the mafia is out of Providence or Boston. So what I mean by that is the boss, he comes out of Providence, the underboss, is out of Boston as a balance of power. Um, that's happened for decades um, because of the prosecutions with Salemi rolling over and Bobby DeLuca rolling over and being witnesses for the government. The Boston guys did not trust Rhode Island guys at all. So it became a balance of power out of Boston. So the boss and underboss were both out of Boston. So Eddie Lado's ascension to underboss is... I wouldn't say it's chilling, but it's certainly interesting um, that Rhode Island has a trusted soul as the underboss, and it's given a little more credibility to Rhode Island, which means the people under Eddie have a little bit more credibility to New England, which is means there could be an insurgent of what they're up to. That's how I look at it. So, Steve, you just uh, mentioned two names, and I, I want to give a little background and throw it back to you. Uh, but you mentioned Frank Salemi, Cadillac Frank, and uh, Bobby DeLuca, a.k.a. Bobby the Cigar. And uh, I want to, again, put this in context for people that might not know the history. So as Steve just said, you know, uh, for, for time immemorial, the, there's been a delicate balance in New England between Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Uh, traditionally, the boss has been out of Rhode Island and the underboss has been in Massachusetts. Um, occasionally uh, that paradigm has, has uh, reversed or, or been inverted right now. We have one of those situations, but uh, I want to go back to a time um, when there was another situation just like this. Um, and it happened in the early nineties. And that will bring us into that Kevin Hanran hit that I mentioned before, but Frank Salemi comes out of prison uh, in the late 1980s, uh, let me let me back up for one second. The, the family had been run by its namesake, Raymond Patriarca, for about 30 years. Uh, Raymond Patriarca dies of a heart attack in 1984. Um, it was kind of sudden. And uh, his son 
Raymond Jr. is is given the reins. And uh, Raymond Jr. wasn't anything like his father. His father was uh, heavily respected and feared and um, had a pretty pretty huge reach. Started off as a street guy way yeah. back in the day. So he had a lot of street cred. So Raymond Jr. takes over, but it is really a silver spoon yeah. uh, gangster that doesn't really have much street credibility, doesn't have a lot of respect from the rank and file. So when Frank Salemi comes out of prison after 15 years, uh, Cadillac Frank uh, was everything that uh, Raymond Jr. wasn't. He was respected. He was feared. He in some in some cases he was beloved, but there were other people that <laughs> that couldn't stand him. Uh, he was a polarizing force. But Frank Salemi comes out of prison and uh, aligns with Raymond Jr. against an insurgence in Boston. And uh, the the Boston insurgents is led by a, a, a cruise in the North End, in East Boston, and in Revere. And there's a shooting war. Uh, Salemi survives uh, being an assassination attempt in front of an IHOP uh, in Saugus, Massachusetts, in the summer of 1989. Takes refuge in California until this uh, acrimony blows over. The rivals to Salemi and Junior Patriarca are jailed six months later uh, in a racketeering case. So the streets are cleared. Salemi comes back to town uh, and takes over his boss. He names at that time his best friend or one of his closest friends, Bobby the Cigar DeLuca, as a quote unquote Kingsman capo, meaning that he is, Salemi was from Boston, although he was aligned with the Providence faction. I know this is confusing. Uh, Salemi was a a guy from Jamaica Plains, half uh, half Irish, half Italian. Could could never get his button because of that. Raymond Senior wouldn't make him. Comes out of prison. Raymond Junior makes him, and it was like he kind of created a monster. And Frank Salemi wanted to take over his boss. Uh, so this is when there's a throwback. Uh, I think the last time. We had the boss in Massachusetts and the underboss in, in Providence was during the Salemi, the Salemi reign when Salemi was the boss in Boston and Baby Shaq's Minocchio was his underboss in Providence. And then Bobby DeLuca was the go-between between, between Salemi and Minocchio. So Salemi and DeLuca both flip. Uh, Salemi flips in 99. DeLuca flips in 06, and the guy that we're talking to right now was the guy that flipped him, uh, Mr. O'Donnell. Probably one of your, uh, one of, one of your shiny moments in, in, your law, in your law enforcement career. But by flipping DeLuca, um, it opens up a Pandora's box of old murders that had kind of been forgotten about. And DeLuca starts going in front of grand juries uh, in around 2016, 2017. And he tips the feds and the Rhode Island State Police off to what really happened to Kevin Hanrahan in September of 1992. I'm going to give the scenario for the next 20 seconds, and I'm going to throw it back to Steve. Uh, Salemi, according to what I've been told by what's being told to the grand jury, by what's come out uh, in some media reports as well as uh, court records, Salemi got word that Patriarcha Jr., from prison was upset with being marginalized or kind of edged out by Cadillac Frank and that P Patriarcha Jr. from prison reached out, reaches out to Kevin Hanrahan, who's an Irish guy, can't get made, but is a very, very um, formidable street collector, enforcer, hitman. And he puts out a, a contract on Salemi and Baby Shaq's Minocchio. That contract, the knowledge of that contract gets back to Salemi and Minocchio, who order a hit on Kevin Hanran. So, Steve, talk, tell us or talk to us about when you were working this crew and you were able to finally get DeLuca to kind of jump ship from the, the bad guys to the good guys. And then how we reached, you know, 10 years later, we, we get to the point where we start talking about Hanrahan. Yeah, it is crazy, and it's sometimes it's. Um, I guess it's some. Um, as you mentioned, it can be difficult to follow. But I guess the bottom line for listeners is that these the wise guys historically, from 
50 years, 60 years, 70 years, they all do the same thing. They turn on each other some way, some capacity, either by force, like Paul Castellano gets murdered by Gotti and his crew, or Gotti's crew takes over. So this is a different way of a different coup. So when these wise guys face big prison time, you know, there's relationships that get fractured, who likes who, who doesn't like who. So what Bobby DeLuca did was Bobby was serving time, and um, he reached out to me from the prison, and he had asked to sit down and talk. Obviously, it's hard to do, especially in Bobby's capacity. At the time, I was a second in command of the state police, so a little bit more visible than when I, as an uh, undercover guy. So long story short, his motivation was to remove Louis from being the boss. So other mob factions have killed the boss. Um, so it was clear to me that Mino- sorry, so the bottom, the, the, he right. wanted to get rid of Louis Minocchio, who, again, right. I know this is really confusing for people, but after Salemi goes to prison uh, in the late 90s and eventually flips and goes and goes into witness protection, his former underboss, Louis Minocchio, becomes the boss of the patriarchal crime family based out of Providence. Um, he is. Uh, how would you explain uh, Louis to, to the audience. He is a, uh, doesn't look like a gangster kind of dresses more like a, um, you know, a lawyer or a, or a, a accountant. He, he's very sharp, but, uh, it, it's very well-spoken, very polished. How else would you explain Louis Minocchio? You know, it's a perf- perfect question, the perfect time, Scott. So what it is, is it's my first job in law enforcement. I was a correction officer in prison. I was in maximum security. I'll never forget it. The first day, I walked in the building as, you know, brand new recruit. There's this, they call it the real hall. It's where the exchange of prisoners happen. Who's coming, who's going. And I see a guy in the real hall in a suit and tie in a briefcase. And I didn't know who it was. And it was Lou Minocchio. I thought he was an attorney. So to describe him, <laughs> and I say that comically because he's a well-dressed, very articulate, um, doesn't, you know, appear on the, you know, the, like the mob look that you would have, but make no mistake about it. He was a feared guy, a murderer, but he was doing double life in prison um, at the time I worked there. He was eventually, this case got overturned. Um, the witness in that case, Red Kelly, um, Louie disappeared for a long time when before he turned himself in. And I remember having a conversation with him in prison. Louie, like, you know, these mob bosses are busting out of prison with helicopters back in the early 80s. And he said, I'll be out a couple of years legally. And sure enough, he was. And what happened was he fled for a long period of time in New York City and Italy. When he came back, the witness had uh, first case Alzheimer's and the case got thrown out because the star witness couldn't testify and his double murder conviction got overturned. He got released. So that's how we describe him. Um, a very um, engaging guy. Um, not one to he was not combative um, as a non-undercover guy. When I dealt with him as a supervisor, even as the colonel and as U.S. Marshal, approachable. He talked. He's not going to tell you anything, but he was. Um, he represented La Cosa Nostra um, indifferently than others, even though he was violent and he was a nasty person behind the scenes. He just had a different way about him. He came from they call the old mustache beats, where they were non the outward appearance that the public would see would be different. So it'd make it hard to understand when you meet him, people liked him, but they also feared him because they knew his reputation. If that makes if that's a good way of describing um, Louis Manacchio. And, and I want to just let people know that during Frank Salemi's uh, roughly six year reign atop the patriarchal crime family, I mean, it was the definition of unstable and uh chaotic and and you know forget about double and triple crosses you were looking for you know quadruple crosses everybody's turning on everybody bodies are dropping every 30 seconds uh and then louis comes in in around 1996 and uh he really tamps down on all of the uh dissension and gets everybody on the same page and kind of resurrects that crime family back to the way it had been before. What's interesting is, and I forgot about this until you just said it, but the motivation for Bobby DeLuca to start talking to you guys wasn't necessarily, or wasn't to get out of the life. Or maybe he was telling you that, but his real motivation was to, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Steve, was to give enough information for you guys to take down Louis Minocchio, a.k.a. Baby Shacks, and then he would slide right into the boss's chair. 
No, you, you're spot on. And he actually said that to me. I know, um, so you understand, every time I met with him or spoke to him on the phone, I recorded it on purpose. And um, that was clearly what he was trying to do. And I tried to tell him, like, Bobby, look, you know, we're not a conduit for you to take over as the boss. <laughs> you cannot. Now, he didn't want to be um, what we call on front street as a testifying witness. So when he started, it was more of a source that he was feeding his information but his goal was to have Louis get taken out and eventually he'd be released. And he thought um, that he would take over the boss and understand their backgrounds. Like Bobby DeLuca, when he was not a made guy, worked at Lincoln Greyhound Park before it was Twin River Casino. And one of his jobs was picking up um, feces after dogs, you know, the dog track. And so just think about what happened with Frank. Frank became the boss. Frank loved Bobby. They were thicker than thieves, and he gave Bobby the power. And then Bobby, you know, in his his mind, felt that we can do the same thing. I'll take Louis out. Somehow he'll figure out how he can ascend or somebody else, as long as not Louis, because he hated Louis. And but it's 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 a typical way these guys operate. But back to your um, hand hand thing. If you want to get back to that, yeah, sorry, you know. we're, I get this is th- this is really my dream having someone. <laughs> Like Steve on the line to be able to pick someone's brain like this uh, for a family like the Patriarchas, which I, I find so intriguing. Um, I've written a lot about it. So to have someone like Steve here to to give us his perspective is just I'm like a kid in a candy store. So, uh, yeah. So let's start. Ta- um, so well, let, let's kind of lead up to it for a second. So uh, you start or Bobby starts cooperating with you, uh, si- or, you know, quietly uh, in 06. By 09, you make the case that brings down Louis Minocchio uh, and, and some other people. Am I right? Or was that 11? Yeah, what happens is yeah, he's talking to me, and it's obviously that's sensitive information at the time. And the reason someone listening might say, well, how come you're talking about it? It's all a public record now. It's right. all in affidavits. Otherwise, we would never talk about it. Um, so Bobby's been outed at his own. You know, right. He became uh, I've, written, I've, written, I've written about this, so it's not it, this is not uh, breaking news. Right. So, you know, Bobby's mentality was, what it was. So there was a point in time where the superintendent of state police that I worked for retired and another superintendent came in and, you know, Bobby didn't see eye to eye that superintendent is the best way to describe it. So I said, Bobby, look, I, you know, I work somewhere. I have to communicate to my boss. It's not like I just do this rogue. And um, he said, you know, he'd prefer because the cases that we're working on obviously leave the jurisdiction of Rhode Island. So everything we typically do we work with the feds. So I had a great relationship with the FBI. So it's simple as picking up the phone. You know, this is what we have. This guy wants to cooperate. He's going to be going when he gets out of prison. All he wanted, Scott, was to be removed from minimum to work release. Mm -hmm. That was his only request. And I told him it can't happen because, you know, if you don't move within facilities according to the rules, you know, any inmate, never mind Bobby DeLuca, Every inmate has a PhD or how the prison works. Right. We move you. Lots of red flags. It's just that, yeah, it's just so we can't do it. And I'm not going to do it. No, am I going to call the director correction to do it? Would he do it for us? Of course. But so we didn't do it. Um, and what I would do is I'd meet him, you know, a couple times a week. I'd take a rip the bus, Rhode Island Public Transit. And it was during bad weather, you know, so I'd wear hoods, hats. I'd meet Bobby. He'd get picked up. You know, he could leave the prison. He'd get a rip the bus. We'd take a ride and I would just debrief him. And then he'd tell us everything, and then we'd work on what he's telling us, one, to verify his information. Eventually, that information was brought to a, a special agent of the bureau that I grew up with that was assigned to Providence, and Joe Degnan. And then Joe became the lead for the FBI and state police, and then Mass State Police and all the other law enforcement agencies. Worked with the bureau doing, you know, what you, we're talking about when, you know, um, taking Louis out and removing Louis from power, charging him. And then, um, you know, obviously Louis going to federal prison and doing his time and then being released. So, Steve, so, so, Steve that, he, so you were working with Bobby between six and nine or was it between six and ten? I'm yeah, talking about 06. 06. Time, 06 was when he starts. Yeah, 06 when he starts. And my involvement, because of the rank that I held, you know, I'm not an investigator. You know, I'm the boss. Right. So and that got turned over to other investigators. And they handled the investigation. Obviously, I'm. Um, uh, I'm in tune with the bureau on a you know weekly basis, talking about what he's doing. So for until the case ended, you know we all collaborated together. But you know Bobby testified in federal court as a federal witness. And at what point does Bobby go into witness protection the first time? Um, 
I'm not positive of the date, but I do remember going to see him and I was having a funny conversation with him. I hadn't seen him obviously in years and, um, you know, he's incarcerated or in custody and, um, he was, you know, surprised to see me. But when he saw me, he said, um, <laughs> he was critiquing me that cause he knew that I taped all our conversations and he said, I can't believe you taped me. You didn't trust me. And I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm going to trust a mob capital who reaches out to me out of the blue that any, you know, any conversation we have was, you know, it's on tape. So you can't say something that's not accurate. In that world, you know, once they're giving up each other, you know, they give up their mother to save themselves. So it's not beyond me for him to concoct a story about me or somebody else. And we want to make sure if they're going to cooperate that they're telling the truth. And in their world, as we found out pretty quick with Bobby and Frank, yeah. So you let, know, they don't lie, but they don't always tell you the whole truth. Right. So let, let me set let me set this up for for the audience. So so Frank Salemi flips because he's pissed at Whitey Bulger. Uh, he finds out that Whitey Bulger, who ha- who he had aligned with on the street, uh, had been giving him up the whole time. Everybody knows Bulger was a corrupt uh, Irish mafia boss in bed with the Boston mafia, or in bed with the Boston FBI, uh, as a way to take down the Boston mafia. Uh, so Salemi flips, goes into witness protection. Bobby, ten years later, flips, goes into witness protection, and it looks like we're all done with Bobby DeLuca and, and Frank Salemi, but. Fast forward to 2016, spring of 2016, uh, the FBI and Rhode Island State Police dig up a dead body uh, behind a old textile mill that had been converted into um, office space. And they find Stevie DeSaro, a former nightclub owner, mob associate who had been killed back in May of 1993. Uh, The owner of this textile, this converted textile mill, uh, I believe his name was Billy Ricci, uh, was a member of Bobby DeLuca's crew uh, and was got caught using the facility to grow marijuana. At that time, marijuana had not been legalized medically in the state, I don't believe. Uh, and in order to get out of the drug case, Billy Ricci, Billy Ricci says to the, to the FBI, hey, 30 years ago, Frank Salemi and Bobby DeLuca buried a body at my on my property. So you got to he you got to, you know, again, picture this. Uh, Salemi and and DeLuca at this point, they'd already debriefed with the FBI. You know, at face value, they were supposed to have told the FBI everything that they had ever done in terms of uh, criminal behavior, murders and and et cetera. Uh, So the second that news broke. In Mar- I believe it was late March of, of 16 that they had dug up Stevie DeSaro. I knew, and, I, and I, you know, I, I'm not a member of law enforcement, but I knew that either very soon or it had already happened, the feds were going to be knocking on the door of uh, uh, Frank Salemi in his witness protection, new identity down in Atlanta, and with Bobby DeLuca in his new witness protection identity down in Florida. So... Yes, that's what happens. By the end of 16, they're both back in custody. And DeLuca has then flipped on Salemi uh, and and gives up Salemi for the DeSaro murder, which then DeLuca is the star witness at the 2018 Frank Salemi trial, where he's convicted of murdering Stevie DeSaro, who was a business partner of of his that he thought was going to cooperate against him. And the, the, now this brings us back to where we were originally. In addition to DeLuca giving them the DeSaro murder, DeLuca cops a plea to being involved in the conspiracy to murder Kevin Hanrahan. And this had been a cold case, just like the DeSaro case, this had been a cold case for almost 30 years. Um, so that's where, you know, where we were about five, six years ago. Uh, Bobby DeLuca's pled guilty to his role in it. I've been told by sources that I trust He's been in front of a grand jury that there have been uh, grand jury proceedings over the last handful of years, hearing testimony in the Eddie or sorry, in the Kevin Hanrahan murder. And some of that testimony points a finger at Eddie Lado for uh, either being one of the trigger men or being uh, involved in the conspiracy. So Kevin Hanrahan left a a dinner, a steak dinner uh, at about 10, 11 o'clock. Somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock on September 18th, 1982, 1992, 
uh, claimed that he was going to meet someone to collect some type of score. Uh, and within minutes of leaving that uh, dinner, he was sh- uh, murdered by two uh, masked gunmen. Bobby DeLuca, about 20 minutes after that, uh, is seen meeting um, possibly with members of the hit team at a restaurant bar in the area. And the Hanrahan hit happened on the 10 year anniversary of another mob murder from Providence, the Raymond Slick Vecchio hit on September 18th, 1982, that Hanrahan might have played a role in as a shooter in that hit. So <laughs> try to unpack some of that for us, Steve. Yeah, you need a scorecard. So yeah. it's uh, interesting. So to your point, uh, Raymond Slick Vecchio um, was killed up on Federal Hill um, by all accounts, informant accounts, never been charged. Kevin Hanrahan, obviously now Kevin's dead. Um, interesting how the mob guys work. So for years after Kevin got hit, he got killed. And you know, to your point, on the anniversary of Slick Vecchio's murder, first thing's going to point to the Vecchios or someone connected to the Vecchios in that capacity when all along it was not the Vecchios, although the vengeance piece makes sense um, until, you know, all this broke in federal court. Um, and Eddie, so I'll give you an example. When, um, you know, we had, I wouldn't say known, but same thing, informant information. When I worked undercover from 1996, we had targeted a guy named Rudolph Lato, who was related to Eddie Lato. And sometimes you don't target guys like Eddie and Louis directly because they're insulated. So you go after the people around him. And the idea of Eddie, uh, Rudolph Leto was if we could get, we charge, you know, we had enough criminal violations on Rudolph Leto, you know, take him aside, see if he'll flip. And then he flips on Eddie Leto, then you can solve the murder. That's really basic law enforcement 101. So um, that, you know, obviously it was a long-term investigation in a place called Decatur Square, which is where um, it's a small clubhouse area to the backside on Federal Hill where, you know, the bookies and the Shylocks, all those people hang around every day like you'd see in a movie, and it's really how it works. So when Rudolph gets arrested, he doesn't give us any information any more than that we could talk about. We prosecute Rudolph. We know who, you know, law enforcement knows who committed the murder, but you got to prove it. So I think in this particular case, you know, with Bobby coming forward with the information, and some people would say, well, how come Leo isn't getting prosecuted because Bobby in federal court pinned this murder on Lado. You got to remember that Bobby lied multiple times, got caught in lies. So as a witness, he has really no credibility for the government to put him on as a witness. And if he's the only piece of evidence, you know, to prove that Eddie was part of the murder of Hanrahan, it's just not going to happen. The government's not going to put on a Bobby DeLuca as just the sole witness, you know, if there was forensic evidence or something else that could pin Eddie to it, it'd be very, very hard just on, a, you know, yep. if it was a mob, you know, if a person with credibility, I'm not sure you can ever use the words together, mob guy credibility, but if Bobby had flipped and everything he said came to fruition, was proven true, he'd make a pretty good witness like other people have in the mob world. But in this case, he's been proven to be a liar multiple times. And he get you know that case just on Bobby Luca's word would get blown out. Uh, I don't even think a grand jury would indict you know because I think you'd have to tell the grand jury about Bobby's you know history of not telling the truth. And I and I also want to make clear to people that although Bobby DeLuca was the star witness at the Stevie DeSaro trial where where Cadillac Frank was was put on trial and eventually convicted, to your point. That wasn't the prosecutor's only card to play. I mean, yes, he was exactly. a star witness, but they had a number of other people that could hit the stand and tell very convincing stories of why Frank Salemi had Stevie DeSaro killed. And you had uh, Bobby DeLuca's brother who testified to helping uh, bury uh, DeSaro. And then you had Stevie Flemmy, who was Whitey Bulger's right hand. Now, I, I'm not positive I believe this, but he testified to walking in while the Salemi crew was murdering DeSaro. When, when Salemi's son was actually strangling DeSaro, Stevie Flemmy says he uh, just dropped by uh, coincidentally. Well, wh- whether or not you believe that, I, I, he <laughs> yeah, testified yeah, to it. Flemmy, he testified to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Stevie Flemmy stopping by a murder is um is uh, just we be more than incredible right <laughs> but he just happened upon one of the 30 or 20, 30 people right. he killed so. but i guess the point i'm making though is it's not just eddie lato if the, if they ever brought a case on the kevin hanrahan hit 
it wouldn't just be Eddie Leto. I mean, Frank Salemi, although he's already in prison uh, serving life, he's 89 years old. He ain't getting any younger. Uh, Louis Minocchio, 95 years old, still alive, in has been retired for the last decade, uh, living kind of in between Florida and, and Rhode Island. Uh, and then uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here because I'm pretty sure I've written about this. And I, I know it's been testified to in front of the grand jury. One of the alleged shooters in the Hanrahan hit is dead. Uh, according to witnesses, uh, uh, Rocco Argenti, who they called Shaky, who eventually became Louis Minoco's conciliary. Um, w- according to testimony at the grand jury, was one of the, the, the shooters, one of the trigger men on the Hanrahan hit. So they couldn't charge Argenti because he's been dead for 20 years. But they could right, charge Eddie Lato. They could charge Cadillac Frank and they could charge Baby Shacks, Minocchio. Yeah, we just remember the witnesses that you have. You know, the, you know, obviously prosecutors use witnesses that have bad histories, but I think you'd have to have something beyond those guys, especially two of them. Um, you know, Frank's going to be, is Frank's, if Frank's admitting to it, you could charge him with it. Um, that gives him some credibility if, if he's getting sentenced for it. Um, but I don't know the particulars because I'm not in that world anymore. You know, why, you know, what the evidence they have or what evidence they don't have against Eddie. But for Frank, him admitting to another murder, no big deal because he's doing whatever time he's going to do and what he's doing. And for Louis Minocchio, you know, he's not charged in that case. And I'm certainly, um, I wouldn't be certain, but I'd be shocked if Louis Minocchio ever cooperated. He had every chance when he went to federal prison on the last case, I remember talking to him in the federal courthouse that you're going to die in prison, Louis. And he told me, oh, you're going to die somewhere, O'Donnell. And he didn't. <laughs> you know, he was released from federal prison and he's been out for a while. I went, um, Tell you a funny story on Louis. Louis, when um, he went to jail, uh, I was the United States Marshal for Rhode Island, and I got in the van with him. And he said, "What are you doing here?" And I explained, you know, my role now, not state police, because he got charged um, while I was the U.S. Marshal, and he got convicted while I was U.S. Marshal. So I said, "Louis, it's time to cooperate and tell your life story. This is your time." And he, as I told you, he said, "You know, uh, it's not going to happen. Never will happen. You know, not on my watch, so to speak." Then when he was released, I was the superintendent of state police. And um, I, you know, media asked me about a comment about Louis being released. And I made a comment that, you know, hopefully Mr. Monarchio has seen the errors of his ways and he will um, be rehabilitated. Something to that effect. And I saw Louis walking on Atwas Avenue a couple of days after that broke. And I stopped to talk to him. And um, he said, O'Donnell, you think I can be rehabilitated? <laughs> and we got a chuckle out of it. So, you know, he's reading, they read their press releases. They read, you know, they're very um, on top of yeah. what, you know, the public and the media talk about them. Yeah, we've heard that uh, the Denunzio brothers, who we haven't mentioned them yet on this uh, broadcast, but they're the guys allegedly that are um, the bosses right now of, of the patriarchal crime family. They're based out of Boston's North End, a social club called the Gemini uh, Gemini Social Club, and I have heard that we're uh, me and Jimmy and the and the OG uh, podcast is required listening to to go into the Gemini Social Club, and they they occasionally sit down and, and chop up what we've been talking about. Yeah, well, interesting. There was a hotel called the Gemini Hotel many many years ago, probably in the eighties. Um, subsequently closed down as a house of ill repute is the best way to describe it. That a guy named Rudolf Schiara yeah. was involved. And uh, not not Bobby DeLuca, but Vito DeLuca, a made guy. They were involved in that. And now I was at high school, actually, late 70s, when the Gemini Hotel, I believe it was in Seekonk, ran. So who knows if, you know, I just think historically, if you look at how all these guys operate, it's the same thing. Either they take their positions by violence or they take it by, you know, ratting. And if there's one thing in there, omerta life, you know, the word omerta is silence. Nobody should rat. And a lot of the bosses across the country have ratted, and some of them, you know, out doing podcasts and talking about what they did. And, and can it becomes, them. yeah, this becomes so <laughs> mainstream that it's like people are numb. That's what these guys did, and it doesn't. And the ones that are out there now, uh, it, again, it's a sworn organization to do criminal violations. And if you, you know, if you wrong them, it, it, you know, murders, murders do happen. And I know it's not to the extent it was decades ago. But like I told you, I see with the Nunzios in power and Eddie Leto 
becoming, you know, a play, better, bigger player in Rhode Island. It, it just it's um, it just tells you that they're still out there, and if we give them another opportunity to make money, and I think part's one of those things. And unfortunately, you know, power in money what drives organized crime, and you can't have if you got them both, you know, you create that vacuum, and they know it corrupts people, it corrupts systems. Um, so I think you know I'm glad to see the state police and the FBI is still on top of those. Um, those matters because, you know, we, we could talk about racketeering statutes, all the things that they designed years ago to a- attack organized criminal groups like La Costa Nostra and all the motorcycle gangs. It's important that these organizations continue to track them because I believe they're part of the um, resurgence of messing up with our the government, how they can in- infiltrate what we do inside, you know, our government. I wouldn't say, you know, I, I want to make, make it crystal clear. I'm not saying government's involved, but, you know, it's not beyond them. They've got involved in the courts before. They've got involved in, you know, legitimate businesses where, you know, next thing you know, your legitimate business is gone because you got involved in a vice with them. And then they'll take full advantage of that if they're strong and powerful enough. And it appears they're starting to take um, some type of resurgence. I have a question for both of you. I'm just interested in the psychology here. Why? Why did Frank and DeLuca not come forward with everything yeah. they knew from the beginning? What, what, None of this could have been. Neither of these guys would have to be in trouble with the right. law again. They had a get-out-of-jail-free car when they were being debriefed uh, for their, they yeah. call it Queen for a Day. Uh, Frank did it in late 99. Bobby did it, uh, I'm guessing, at some point between 6 and 11. Uh, but both of them decided to leave out huge parts of what they did, which then came back to bite them. What, you know, with Frank Salemi, I, I was talking to Jimmy about it off air, you know, with the Tesoro hit, Frank Salemi's kid was involved. And if the kid was still alive, it would make sense. Right. But when, but when Frank flipped, the kid had died. So yeah. what, what motivate, I'm, I'm just emphasizing Jimmy's point. What, what was the motivation for DeLuca and Salemi when they were, when they had their opportunity to come completely clean? Why didn't they? From my perspective, most of that is those two, their relationship was strong. Um, Frank took care of Bobby. Bobby took care of Frank. They were in the trenches together. Bobby, you know, was a nobody in the business. And Frank was a somebody. What I mean by Frank was a somebody. Frank earned his bones. He was a nasty, vicious guy. Killed a lot of people. Yeah, and Bobby, I would say, you can't call him a murderer, uh, but he wasn't like Frank. Frank was kind of like a Woody Bulger type. Lodge in a life, rogue, wild. Bobby wasn't wild. You know, Bobby kind of got led by Frank, but loved the life. And I'm telling you from a guy that knows Bobby. So I don't think they want to, you know, they're in their crazy minds. You have to understand how they think from a rational person, you and us talking on this phone. They think totally different from us. They think that they can outsmart everybody, that they're smarter because they're pretty streetwise. And maybe... Um, they won't find out we did this. Well, so in essence, I'm, you know, my gut tells me, and I want to, you know, give me your opinion on what my gut says. My gut tells me that back in '99, Cadillac Frank didn't give up the Desaro hit because he would have had to give up his best friend Bobby DeLuca, and in 2009, Bobby DeLuca didn't give up the Lado or Desaro hit because he would have had to give up his best friend Cadillac Frank, even though at that point they weren't, you know, on the street together. Yeah, and I'll tell you this story with Bobby. When Bobby first started talking to me. Um, when we got into, you know, one thing's I won't give you guys name because he's not, um, I wouldn't say he's a mob guy, but he's kind of associate. In I, Bobby I, said Lato, I, meant Han- I meant Hanran. I meant DeSaro and Hanran. I think I might have said Lato. I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, no problem. And when Bobby said, I'm not giving up so-and-so, no matter what, I'm not giving him up. He was good to me when I was in prison and he gave me a job when I got out of prison. So, you know, in their minds, they have weird loyalty. Like, you know, when the feds tell them you got to cooperate and give up everything, um, you know, they pick and choose. And so I'm, I'm certain Frank and Bobby still didn't come fully cocoa on other things. It might not be murders, but it might be um, scams, some scam that they knew about in real estate. Well, Frank, well, or- Steve, I- I'll tell you, Frank Salemi left out about uh, anywhere between 10 and 15 murders in his debriefing and in, in, you know, from what my research tells me. And he didn't, uh, Steve, I, I'm guessing you know this, but all the stuff that he copped to in terms of um, uh, homicides was all stuff that, that took place in the, in the 60s. 
He didn't cop to one in his debriefing in 99. He did not cop to ordering or carrying out one murder between 1988 and 1996. Yeah, that's what gets forgotten about a lot is, you know, the you know who ordered the murder. An example would be in Rhode Island and um, Jerry Tillinghask, an Irish hitman who was deceased and his brother Harold were convicted of killing a guy named George Basmazian. And the, when Jerry went to prison, he was on tape saying, arguing with one of his confidants to go see Rudolph Schiaro and tell Rudolph, ask Junior why I'm, if he knows why I'm doing life. You can interpret it two ways, that I, because I shut my mouth or because I went to jail for murder. I said, in my mind, it's because he does, I, I'm, I never gave you up because the hit came from Raymond Jr. So that's never been prosecuted. Nobody can prove that. Because the only person who could testify that would be Jerry Tillinghast. And if Jerry got the order from Patriarca or if he got the order from Rudolph. And those people die. So it's such an insulary group of people. And then if they do testify or become government witness, that's just their word. And, um, you know, so their the organized structure they set up is done by design, you know, from boss to underboss to capo to lieutenant to soldiers. Technically, you know, guy in the street's not supposed to be talking to boss. And obviously that was Louis Monarchio's demise. He was talking directly to guys that weren't made guys. And that's honestly, that's how a lot of people have gotten jammed up. The boss goes directly to people on the street or they don't have a buffer, you know, because the buffer is usually the person like Bobby and Frank were talking about, they trust each other that they'll never give each other up. So my guess is you're absolutely correct that Bobby and Frank will go to their death, that there's things that they'll never share with anybody unless somebody comes forward that can prove another way and then they get brought back on the hot seat. For, you know, you, know from you think about the, there's a qualitative component here too. There's a parallel with the episode we just did on Philadelphia. It shows you the state of the mafia in the 90s, at least for some of these families. Because in the golden age, guys like Ralph Natale in Philadelphia and Cadillac Frank in Boston probably wouldn't even have been made, let alone ascend the boss. <laughs> to, to the yeah. boss. So, well, they're both guys that had to wait after long prison sentences. For right. whatever reason, it didn't get made in the 60s and 70s. Right. They had to wait until the 90s or in the case of Frank Salemi, late 80s to get made after the fact. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised then that their their leadership style was dysfunctional when when they probably weren't boss material to, to begin with if, if that makes sense and, and steve yeah, well, look at look at bobby's brother bobby's brother get made and it, it would twist my brain and other investigators how does bobby's brother ever get made and nobody knew that and, and isn't this yeah, a perfect steve isn't this a perfect example i'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you isn't this a perfect example of how people well you know they'll look at old charts or old comments that the, the federal government made 20 years ago about how many May guys are here, how many May guys are there. There are, you know, this is a secret society. The, 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 when the mafia makes people, they don't issue press releases. <laughs> right. So a guy like Joe DeLuca, I, I didn't even know who Joe DeLuca was, let alone that Joe, Joe, Joe DeLuca was a made guy. But everybody found this out during the DeSaro trial because he took the stand. Nobody, I'm, I'm telling you, nobody that were that was watching the mob from, you know, from a distance, not being, you know, a part of it. Nobody knew who Joe DeLuca was, and nobody knew he was made until the 2008. Me, right. his, he, I didn't know, and his brother's cooperating with me. And right. so I, I found out the same way you did. And, you know, because we used to scratch our head when you hear, like, a Joe DeLuca being made. It's like, he's, never, he's not involved in anything. And sure enough, you know, help moving a body, I guess, counts in the murder. And I think for the listeners, to be a made guy, one of the things besides being Italian uh, and being in the crew, you had to commit a murder. So I guess you can make the leap of faith. He moved the body. Um, but I can tell you anecdotally of, of um, you know, other made guys from New England or other organized crime factions, Nicky Scafos, or these people that have gotten made that some, in, you know, Rhode Island, a guy bought his way into it. It's all in mm -hmm. the public record from Bobby DeLuca. They paid yeah. to become made guys. And they're, you know, like they try and portray themselves to be mainstream Rhode Islanders. And, you know, maybe 10 years ago, they'll be involved. Someone will tell you that they were involved in some type of homicide. But the um, application process has been diminished over the over decades. Yeah. And the quality, the quality of gangsters has been diminished. Now, you know, take that for whatever it's worth. Well, we yeah, got to buy their button. Guys we we, we got to wrap up here. Yeah. This was awesome. I just want to throw two real quick things at you and then we're going to say goodbye. Um, 
I noticed a through line uh, as we were talking. You, you were referencing Rudy Sciarra, uh, who was one, an OG, OG. I mean, an OG's OG in the uh, world of the New England Mafia uh, was a capo that Eddie Lato came up under. So did Slick Vecchio, though. So I, I, I've been told that Eddie Lato was buddies with Slick Vecchio. Is that true? Meaning well, that there could have been some added motivation on the Hanrahan job. It wasn't just an order coming. It, it was also people carrying out the order, but doing it with glee, I guess. Yeah, without question. So Kevin really irritated a lot of the mob members, but he was always protected because Louis felt that he was a guy that was so rogue, he'd do whatever they asked him to do. So um, when he got too rogue, obviously he's going to take out Louis and Frank, then he's got to go. But to your point, so Eddie and those guys, sometimes a guy like Henry had, had more authority, so to speak, because the bosses liked him and protect him. They didn't protect him because uh, anything more than they had this killer that they could refer to that would do what they wanted to do. A um, little bit more, like just a dangerous rogue guy. In their world, it's always good to have a guy like that around. And obviously he got too rogue and he paid the price for it. So, yeah. Um, and I, my guess is but I told, he I, didn't get killed because he, they were told you cannot. He was never sanctioned to kill him right. you know, for retaliation. But I, I was told that Eddie was really close or relatively close with Slick Vecchio and kind of relished the assignment to knock off Hanrahan. Now, this is, you know, secondhand information, so I don't know. Uh, last thing I'm going to throw at you, and then we're going to say goodbye. Yes or no, does Eddie Leto ever face charges in the Kevin Hanrahan head? I'm, I'm going to say no. Well, I'm interested in what, what, you, what you think. Well, if it's not a yes or no, it's a hopefully yes. The answer would be yes, because nobody has the right to kill anybody, no matter what reason, and hopefully there's enough evidence to charge um, you know, no matter who gets killed, nobody has a right to do that. Oh, I'm not so, saying he has a right you know. to get away with murder. I, I, I think he should be charged. I'm just saying reading the tea leaves and through, again, what I've heard, four years of grand juries, it's like, well, if they haven't come up with the evidence at this point to indict, are they going to come up with the evidence in the next couple months or next couple of years? Or, I, I was anticipating Eddie Lato to be indicted two years ago on this. And, you know, he's he's got the last laugh on me, at least. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I think if, if there's not enough evidence coming out of if there's a grand jury or not, then the, just to your point, we've talked about over the years, things just happen. Like somebody comes forward and said, hey, listen, there was a body buried in my, and right. that just opened up a whole new case. That could happen. You know, no statute limitations on murder. So um, hopefully he gets prosecuted if he's in fact the person that did kill him. And, this was... um, Thank you so much, Steve. This was one of my favorite episodes we've ever recorded. We've recorded about 100 of them, and this goes in my top two or three. Uh, we, we definitely want to have you back uh, if, if, you're, if you're game. I'd love to just do a whole episode on his undercover work. We didn't even be able to get into that. But he was undercover in the patriarchal crime family, uh, and, and so we could do a whole other episode with him a couple months from now and, and just get that story, if that's cool with you, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. No problem at all. This was great. Is there anything you want to uh, promote or let people know uh, where they can find you? Or I know you're not someone who like, has written a book or anything, but I just want people that, that are interested in your insight. I know you do a lot of stuff with Tim White um, at WPRI. Yeah, and no, anywhere else? You know, there's no platform that I talk about this. I'm in the middle of, I've been in the middle of a book for a while. I was um, actually doing something with um, a producer in Hollywood about, oh. you know, undercover stories. So, um, someday, you know, it's um, it's the perspective, not just of the mob undercover, but, you know, I did it while I had a family and kind of lived a different life. And it's just um, intriguing. But to me, it, it, you know, it helped me in my career because under and even now outside of, you know, I'm not actively law enforcement, but just understanding how they think and, you know, where they are in the world. You know, I run into them even on the job. I'd run into them. even now I run into different people. Um, I'll just tell you, Jerry Tillinghast, who I did a case on. He, um, he came to my class at Salve and spoke. This is a mob hitman who um, I brought him in. I said, look, I'm not going to glamorize him, but I want you to tell this group of students are going to go into law enforcement or law who you are. And, you know, you know you're not going to admit to crimes that you committed, but tell them, like, I want people in the law enforcement world or up and coming cops to know there's people out there like them and how they think, because you have to know in order to police the enemy, you got to 
know how the enemy thinks in any world, if it's law enforcement, military, or whatever else. Sports, you know, research the, research the opponent. They do. They're very cognizant of what law enforcement does. So I think law enforcement has to be very cognizant how the, how they operate too. Well, we all owe you a debt. I mean, this is the type of uh, you know American hero that we like having on to to you know shine a spotlight on such a, a, a accoladed career. You know, so many high points. You know, really, we thank you for the debt, uh, or we thank you for the work that you've done. Um, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, everybody uh, in New England, obviously, but us that just you know study this stuff and and make this uh, you know kind of our passion and our living. Um, you know, you're 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 the lifeblood. So thank you so much for joining us, giving us uh, that kind of insight and perspective. We want to have you on again, but uh, Steve, this was this was amazing. Thank you so much. No, appreciate. It. I'll close with this: the lifeblood of it really is the people that support those that work. You know, this world. You know what I mean? They're um, when I worked undercover, there's a whole support system from state police, local police, more FBI that, you know, undercover backgrounds and protecting who you are and, you know, getting all this stuff done and, you know, wiretaps and bugs and prosecutors, all that. There's a lot that goes into besides, you know, the one or two or 10 people that, you know, are investigators on this. So there's a lot to it. And it's, you know, I've learned a lot about law and wiretaps and bugs and, you know, and then honestly, the last thing I'll say is a lot of people don't get prosecuted, but it doesn't mean they didn't do something yep. they shouldn't have done that's illegal. And the intelligence piece of that law enforcement, if you arrest 10 people, there's another 50 that, you know, interconnected with this group. And they may be all walks of life in the state you live in, yep. especially Rhode Island, wherever you go, you know, like a chuckle, I'll meet somebody. I'm like, oh, my God, that guy was related to this guy. You know, he owns an oil company or he owns construction company and they might not know i even know that but i you know that's the stuff that kind of stinks because if you're my sons I had to grow up in that world because i limited you know who they could associate with because you just know you know so much depth of how the system works yep it, it, it kind of stinks for them and in terms of what you just said steve you're preaching to the choir we're from detroit the detroit mafia is the most stealth um connected juiced in mafia family ever uh these guys live their whole lives without having to go to prison with probably dozens of murders uh in on their resume and they die uh very very wealthy and uh, free men uh, our the boss of our of, of our mafia got indicted on a rico and uh, did less than a year in prison so you, you do the math. On, you do a math on that one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Because 10 year minimum. So I hear you. Thank yeah. you, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys. All right. This Thank is, you, Steve. This is OG Podcast. Please like, subscribe, share. We're going to keep bringing you that true crime content that you love. More bells and whistles, more resources, more uh, opportunities to engage. We're going to give it to you. We know you like it. We love bringing it to you. So till next week, for Betty Behind the Glass and JB, I'm Scott Bernstein. OG Podcast out.